you rejoin us. More Hawksmoor. Yes. I'm George Kinjal. I'm Luke Jones. This is about buildings and cities. And there's also super special guest. Matthew Lloyd Roberts is me. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Welcome back. And you're rejoining us for the second part of our discussion of the churches of Nicholas Hawksmoor. Yeah, the London churches. <laughs> the cool stuff. We're trying not to think about how the edit for this is going to go because I can't really get it straight. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Matt can do it, can't it? you will love it. He loves the challenge. I think it, in the site recordings, we're talking about what we're seeing and we're talking about the details of the churches, but we should say a little bit about what they reveal as an approach in general, particularly the four East End ones. So St. Alphage's in, in Greenwich, St. Anne's in Limehouse, St. George in the East in Shadwell, and Christ Church in Spitalfields. They are all these really big, really white kind of sheds with these quite shallow pitched roofs, really massive, and they all have an enormous spire, a really, really big monumental spire, which absolutely like inscribes them onto the the landscape of the city they are masonry strong monumental forms in portland stone and on their exterior they use the vocabulary of classical forms and elements in a very original and surprising way they all have that there's a few other things they share they're all freestanding uh with a little bit of land around them although not often a lot. The interiors are all quite similar, which is a long, oblong, very pale ceiling, galleries on the two sides, which have mostly been taken out, sometimes reinstated. Victorians weren't weren't up for being above the altar. It's a very bad idea. And the tower with the spire on it is usually at the west end, which you go through to get into the church. But then on the outside, there will be some extra bits somewhere to kind of break up this blocky massing. So yeah, porticos I'll... or little funny towers on the side or something like that. And that's a lot of the kind of thing which we're describing and trying to get our heads around in the site recordings. Um, I think we should talk a little bit about the ideology behind that particular approach to church design, which represents sort of the settled principles of the commission. Those are articulated particularly in a couple of sets of proposals which are made. So there's so Wren himself made a set of proposals and Vanbrugh, who is a slightly younger but also uh, established architect, also made a set of proposals about what the churches should be like, how we're going to do this properly, what, you know, what the ideal is which they're trying to um, strive toward. You've already mentioned one of them, that they are all, uh, they're meant to be insulate. They're all, they're meant to stand proud of surrounding buildings and that's very necessary for their which just means islands. Yeah, isolated freestanding state. Yes. There are some good quotations that we have from Vambra's proposals that maybe is worth yeah. reading to give a sense. That horror with which a solemn gloom is apt to fill the mind naturally raises our veneration, and there is always somewhat of an austerity in majesty. I think that's something that these East End churches that we've been talking about definitely fulfills this vision of uh, grand, massy, strong forms. I think we can go through them in a bit more detail. So the, he's, there are these kind of prosaic ones, like the reason why you want to have them not joined onto any buildings is that it makes them safer from fire. Although, Which is jolly good because they've basically all burnt down. Yeah, the majority of them have burnt down at some point, but luckily they're so strongly built it doesn't really matter. Well, it might account for part of the reason why the interiors feel a bit duff because they were all done in like the 1960s or... Or in the nineteen, or in the eighteen sixties. Yeah, he says also that that like it's worth building them incredibly, like very strongly. He basically like, he makes a pitch against value engineering, um, but saying that that it may turn on five hundred pounds, whether it shall be crippled in a hundred years or stand like a rock for a thousand. But this is quite defendable from our context because these churches have really stood out except that actually just the Hawksmoor ones and like a couple of the other ones, like we don't. So perhaps there should be another one, which is have a really shit hot person <laughs> design them. <Yeah. laughs> I mean, there's, so there's this, there's the proposals from Vanbra, but then there's also a letter that Wren writes to the commissioners. And it's an interesting exercise in how different Wren and Vanbra are in their thinking about design. Wren is very straightforward and boring, basically, in his language and in what he's proposing He's stressing things like 
don't let them bury bodies, don't let them have a graveyard near to the church walls, because otherwise the ground will slowly raise up and... Also, that you you can't have people buried in the church, which obviously is something which is done kind of in that gen- period yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah, because it there's a, there's a hierarchy of pitches. Best pitches in the in the choicer bits of the inside, and then you want to be on the like south side. That's right, isn't it? And then east, then west. Yeah, and then you don't want to be on the north. And and Ren there is sort of learning from his time spent acting as a surveyor to various medieval buildings. For example, he goes and does a survey of Salisbury Cathedral and he's has various problems with the way that churches have been built in the past and this is a new way of building fu- building churches for the future. Yeah, so there's all of that. And then at the level of the design of the church, they're all, uh, they're like, they're big they're white they have windows quite high up and not too like big but not too big without any stained glass yeah rather obvious point like no graven idols yeah they stained glass no wall paintings no not much no no statuary really except for big old um royal stuff it's discussed in one of some of the proceedings so they have galleries like on either side uh, and it's discussed at some point by the commissioners whether it's a good idea to separate out men and women i think that that's no i don't think that actually happens but like they are sort of thinking through the options there and the other thing about galleries is that as ren says in his proposals it's about getting as many bums on seats in audible distance to the priest as possible and there's a it's g- not that different from his design for the theater in oxford yeah. sheldonian it's kind of like this packed in galleried space just to maximize your ability to hear the singing in that case and there's a key thing which so there's a key thing about orientation which is they got a point east which is easy in some sites and not so not so easy on others and then there's a thing which we already talked about in the site recordings which is that they can't really have a strongly expressed apse or chancel where the altar is going to be in the case of the 1666 act churches that's a big no no that's a really that's still a very very contentious idea and in these churches you start to see a creeping in of architecturally distinct chancels which is something that the tories want to have. want to do it yeah yeah the tories want to have these architecturally distinct chancels and you don't have it at for example alfages but then they start to creep in uh, and they can get away with it without causing a riot. Yeah, but so so just at a symbolic level, it's important. What's at issue is whether the altar and the the priest, the officiant, are occupying like a slightly different or something that is expressed as a different space from the congregation. Whether it's all everyone's in exactly the same kind of under the same roof. Yeah. yeah. So the, like in extremists in the like hotter sort of Catholic, uh, Protestant. They'd put the altar, they'd made it just into a table and put it like sort of semi into the congregation and have the yeah. priest in the congregation and they're all doing it together. And then the Anglicans are gone, oh, I'm not sure, it's a bit much. And then they had an altar at the front, but it's still in the same room. But maybe raised on a step or you might yeah, get a bit. rail. It, a little yeah. bit of something, a little bit. <clears throat> and, and then some people are wanting to... Basically, put it in another room, <laughs> yeah. off to the front, and um, yeah, get a bit more, yeah, bit sense more of Vatican separation and, yeah, and sense of hierarchy of space within the churches themselves. And harking back to our discussion of Victorian Christianity, you know, at that point in the mid nineteenth century, that's really hot. They get up. to do it. They People, get to do it. You know, you're putting a sort of screen in between them. You're making it. It must have felt so excited. It was all very transgressive. Oh, God, the excitement. You've got to have three steps. You have like a little golden, yeah, like rail for kneeling down at. Yeah, so those are the kind of general principles that we're seeing. There is one other thing that you get in these uh, early 18th century act churches, which is that you need to have some kind of a crest and we talk about this in some of the site visits, but they're expressed uh, in different ways. For example, at St. George's Bloomsbury, the uh, lion and the unicorn are expressed as enormous sculptural it tends additions to the spire. Big sculptures, rather higher and about the same size as the cross. Yes. Um, sort of in the same place, but above it. Just in case you're in any doubt that that 
church and state yeah. Yeah. And message. The, the, the queen or king at the time is the supreme is it head or governor at that point, I don't know. But anyway, boss. Yeah, boss yeah. of the of the church. Uh, we might go to our conversation in St. George in the East there. By now, by the way, very wet. This is... I hope you understand our absolute <laughs> commitment. We are really we are really suffering. So we're seeing this is another one which presents they all kind of present this incredible, like, shed-like aspect, don't they? It feels, this one's the most, feels like Ravenna. Yeah. Well, these, so the, the corners, I mean, it, in all of them, the corners tend to be expressed by something, but in this case, they're these rather magical little strange pepper pots. So this one was bombed and was not rebuilt in its original form. So I don't actually know I th- where, what, I, don't... Where, I think that if you see the inside, it's, it's quite different it's now. It's very bad. Uh, they haven't redone it sensitively. No, I think they should probably just rebuild it properly. One of the interesting things on the back, so we're looking at, again at one of these very abstract looking classical forms. It's got like a big, the, the big kind of... This is seriously late antiquity though. Yeah, but well, the, thing, the thing, it has bulging out of the back of it. This one has a true apse. Yeah, uh, and rather, again, in this, it, rather like the last one we were looking at, has this sublimated Gothic element. This is very much a sort of sublimated Romanesque element, which has been, uh, to some extent, transformed the, the tower into the... has really got that, like, that bits nicked off classical buildings vibe. Although, again, kind of deco curtains on top of the... Yeah. Um, and so we see, uh, we see an awful lot of kind of primitive elements on this one don't we there are the the tower itself looks a bit like that famous mausoleum of the visigoths or whatever doesn't it oh it's a sort little of, bit like, the, like uh, maybe uh, the, the Odorica, Odorica. Odorica. yeah although yeah You've got like this like things. this like octagonal uh arched. yeah these tall maybe, arched openings maybe a little bit and that's probably that's just that's just something I happen to have been to. <laughs> but then, and then we've got, yeah, this big, again, like it's sort of big pediment, the Roman, this kind of early Romanesque element poking out at us. What's the deal with the pepper pots? Where do the pepper pots come from? It's a triple decker. So it's like an octagonal tower, but a miniature one, a miniature octagonal tower with a little dome on the top. And then it's got these three stories of arched openings, which and- go... And then these, so these door frames that are underneath the pepper pot are, I think, some of the most exciting muscular sculptural work that Hawksmoor does. I just really, really love these enormous keystones and then these funny little sort of elliptical holes in the wall and there's such a sense of depth. Yeah, you have the sense, because these, there's this enormous keystone which is placed directly above a, a, a horizontal elliptical opening it's almost as if the upper element is like squishing an originally circular oculus down in again you've got points for angles where it's clearly reaching for something with a precedent the back is really kind of it's like ravenna it's like the small memorial church at the back of the basilica in ravenna but then you turn around and it's completely subverted it and another one where i think he's playing with a quite different effect on the inside to the outside so the outside has got these complicated massing which have then got complicated masses of decorations on them. And the inside is quite a pure... I mean, it's got the apse, but it's basically an oblong. Yeah. Ah, now we're coming around to the front. This one is very... got a lovely sighting. It's got this old... I guess there's the old rectory over here. This sort of nice old Georgian house. As you climb the steps, you can then see that over the other wall, there's the, the like, motorway going out to the Canary Wharf. It was all, it was all bombed out, and they sort of rebuilt a smaller church with creating a new courtyard on the inside. They rather optimistically uh, felt, I think, that if they reduced the capacity by 50%, they would fill it. Yeah, which is not really happening. It's got, it's got slight echoes of a very, very sub Coventry cathedral. If we sort of backtrack a bit and look up at the tower, there are two sorts of massiveness, which are very important to the effects of all of these buildings. One is that the, the mass of the actual hall itself is always very wide, very large, very high, with this sort of quite flat pitched roof. And then the other is that the towers are always enormous. They're overscaled even for the very large size of the building of which they're a part. And they offer at times really strikingly blank faces of masonry uh, with various levels of recession carved into them. But, but there are just these enormous 
blank masses yeah. that have a real effect yeah. on the viewer. So um, on this one, you have um, we've got kind of the the entrance level. We have these these sort of curving kind of volute gestures, which where the the horizontal kind of comes up and becomes the tower, but, and then it's subdivided into these horizontal bits, which are actually quite sort of shallow. There's quite a lot of layers often with these quite little elements which are multiply recessed into the same hole. So you've got like a square hole and then we've got an arched hole and then you've got a little arched window which is even smaller and it's all kind of poking in. And then further up we've got one of those semicircular lunettes again but it's multiply recessed. It's kind of going, there's a littler one inside a bigger one inside a bigger one inside a bigger one and then the tower right up at the top. We've got again we've got a repetition of that sort of Boston stump uh, that's being expressed in classical forms, alluding to yeah. Gothic steeple resolution. Yeah, so the top of the tower is an octagon that's been like extruded up, and then at each corner of the octagon, there's like a square oh, map. So the, the, the corners, it's kind of like a cogwheel. All of the corners are turned into these little teeth sprouting up. And then at the top of each of them, what is that thing, which is like the top of, it's kind of like a capital, but it's actually all just made of folded fabric. So I think it's this repetition of this Roman altar idea. Yeah, that or, recurs, funerary, or, or funerary, funerary monument. monument. But this one is like, it's covered in, in, in um, curtains. Yeah. Stone yeah. curtains. Which again is something the Romans would do. It's the element that marks out the borders at Alphage as well, the edge of the sort yeah. of sacred ground. Uh, that, and it's funny, right? You had yeah. loads of these funerary monuments lying around all over the place. Each of the churches have a particular characters in the decoration though as well. And this one, all, a lot of the openings are very tall and thin and a lot of stuff has been really stretched upwards mm. with, with a kind of lighter, more playful decoration, both on the sides. Yeah, it's very abstract and very... But then it does have these little moments of lushness, so the little ionic pilasters around the doorway or these things which are just bunched on the side of the tower which have little, I don't know, sort of trophies or something up at the top. We want to tell you about our new sponsor. I think there's some architects listening. Are there any architects listening? Are you an architect? Are you an interior designer? Do you buy furniture in a professional capacity? Maybe you work for a hotel. Maybe you own a restaurant. Well, listen to the end of the advert and then see whether this might be you. Uh, We want to talk to you about Article. Article is an online only furniture company. They were founded five years ago. Five years ago, they were four people around a desk. This year, they sold $100 million worth of furniture. That doesn't happen if the product is no good. Yeah, yeah. I think it's because they're making people's lives easier, don't you? The furniture is classic mid-century Scandinavian or like West Coast Californian vibe stuff made to a very high degree of finish, very very refined design. That means you can put it in most projects and it's not going to come back to be trouble for you later on. And it's risk-free because if you don't like it, they will take it back. Interior designers, architects and other businesses can access exclusive pricing and tax-exempt purchasing on their entire furniture catalogue as well as specialised service, by joining Article's trade programme. And that's what we want to talk to you about. You also get your items faster than uh, normal normal people. Not that uh, anyone ever has deadlines. Yeah. <laughs> this has never happened to me. So you can get um, your items in two weeks or less. Um, you can deliver, they can deliver most items even faster. Uh, you potentially, subject, you can also pick up stuff yourself from warehouses. There are all kinds of options. If you've got However tight you think your deadline is, you really should look at this as an option. Also, if you're buying a lot, you get better you get better prices. Their customer service is not like the kind of thing that you're used to in the construction industry. You mean they pick up the phone? They pick up the phone in an average of six seconds. And on the other end of the line, they have got a lot of people who are themselves architects and interior designers who understand they feel your pain where you're coming from and are prepared to sort out your problems so take advantage of these benefits and become an article trade member today to do that you need to go to aboutbuildings.article.com and sign up that's aboutbuildings all one word dot a r t i c l e dot com 
So I think we should talk. There's a there's a deeper level of kind of theory that's going on in the design of these churches, which we alluded to a little bit earlier, which is this idea about what an ideal church should be, you know, where the model for such a thing might come from. And there's this sort of mental gymnastics going on within the sort of higher reaches of the Anglican church, where they know that they can't be Catholic. Equally, they're not very keen on being Calvinist. And they are looking for a sort of historical legitimacy for the type of new church which they want to create, which is going to be founded in history, but which is not going to be sort of tainted with the the sin of um, of uh, all of the popes. You know? Yeah, and everything that went wrong in medieval Catholicism. And it's in a context of antiquity being held in high esteem. And I think um, we, because it's religious, we can forget these... I, I think those two things are brought together. Well, I think... In, in sort of architectural terms, part of the problem that is being worked out from the early 17th century right the way through to this period, to the early 18th century, is how do we build a church that's acceptable to English audiences, to English congregations, out of classical stuff? Because yeah. we want to build classical buildings. Yeah. We are learned architects like your Inigo Joneses through your Wrens. You know, we, we don't want to build in the Gothic, but we need to build churches. And how do we build churches that are appropriate for Christian worship out of classical bits and bobs? And not too and not too catholically baroque as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a problem, isn't it? So the 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 baroque style in Italy is obviously a, would be counter reformation. It's really. a problematic model. So there's. I just want to say that there's a one of the things which. Um, Hawksmoor presents to the commissioners is this famous little sketch called the Basilica of the Primitive Christians manner of building the church as it was in the 4th century in the purest times of Christianity, which is this sort of little plan sketch, isn't it? With presenting this design to the commissioners, I think it's a moment of really seeing Hawksmoor's knack for playing to the client right he's he knows what the client wants he's been paying attention to the sort of nattering that's going on in tory circles they're very interested in looking at the primitive origins of christianity as a way to reintroduce higher liturgy and get around problematic catholic associations and so hawksmore with this is really playing to the playing to the client and giving the client what they need to to give him the job basically yeah and it's it, it, it's it's a kind of an interesting they're reaching for an interesting sort of compromise aren't they because what, it, what is the, the what do you think the characteristics of that plan are for me the most striking features of the plan are the fact that we clearly have an apse right on the east end of the church or am i misreading that i mean i think that the model of the primitive christian church is inaccessible in various ways. I don't think it's being proposed that it's a straightforward model which you can build on, but I think it's uh, it's something which you can kind of gesture toward. I, I have a quotation. Uh, so this is a quotation from a, a letter that Hawksmoor wrote to the Dean of Westminster Abbey when he was designing the West Towers of of Westminster Abbey, which is later, that's in the early 1730s. But in that he writes... What is vulgarly meant by this term Gothic is the manner of building so different from the Greek and Latin style which came in at the fall of the Roman Empire. The primitive Christians wanted churches. They would not or could not make use of the temples of the Gentiles. How could they? For the cells of their temples were small and dark, and none came there but the priests to burn incense." Indeed, there were some temples of other forms, capacious enough, as at Rome, the Temple of Peace, the Pantheon, and others, but most of them were either demolished or the Christians then esteemed them profane. They did make use of some basilicas for churches, as at St. John Lateran and St. Mary Major at Rome, and the Emperor Constantine built the Basilica of St. Peter in the Vatican from the ruins of several other buildings, but in a very unskillful manner. I think I think basically what's going on there is that Hawksmoor has this very vivid vision of early 
Christians around just before or immediately after the collapse of the Roman Empire, building their places of worship out of the leftover despoiled chunks of the grand buildings of of classical antiquity and i think i think that is a vision that is not entirely based in historical fact but that is a vision of a historical moment that speaks very powerfully to the people that he's trying to get to commission him for this job what's the word for that there's a word. spolia spolia spolia, spolia. Right. and like it does happen like Arken is a nice example of that charlemagne's palace is built out of big marble columns that are like shifted up from rome and italy all the way up yeah. to um, and in fact germany even, i mean the late, yeah. even ravenna you know the, yeah. a lot of the churches yeah. of the exarchate are like that and you can see how that manages to kind of sidestep several issues it says well we can be a bit classical because it's it, yeah. it, it's like it's like Christians stealing bits of classical buildings yeah. physically. That's yeah. why, and we're yeah. copying, we're sort of recreating the effect of stealing chunks of. It's not the buildings have been de-paganized by Christians taking chunks of them, and that's how it can kind of fit in with this. And that kind of appeals to this sort of taste notion of grand tourists going to look at ruins. Well, I mean, the tone of some of the letters makes it sounds to me a little bit like he's also responding to. A demand or a kind of an interest on the part of the members of the church to know more about this model. The desire to kind of reach back to that as a model is not coming from necessarily from the architects, but is something which they're sort of responding yeah, to. And, and uh, that's why I'm just sort of trying to stress is the idea that Hawksmoor is playing to his audience here, and he knows what what is going to get him in the good books of the Tory commissioners, and talking about these themes, these ideas of primitive Christianity. Is, is, is an idea that's going round these Tory circles in the early 18th century. Joseph Bingham, uh, the reverend, who's a very high church Tory, produces a book called Origines, which is, again, an experiment in getting around this problem of how do we do high church liturgy without being too Catholic? And the answer is that we do it like they did in the 4th century AD. And so Hawksmoor is playing to that audience. Which basically means however we want. So it has this other architectural consequence, which is that at the level of kind of the, the play of elements, it's extremely liberating because it means that just as those buildings were built out of the scraps of antiquity, at least in the uh, story, so these can deploy all of these different elements which are taken out of all of the different examples which exist in whatever way kind of seems interesting and fun and appropriate as long as the overall effect is that one that you quoted from Vanbra's letter uh, a moment ago which might be worth repeating the grace should generally be expressed in a plain but just and noble style without running into those many divisions and breaks which other buildings for a variety of uses may require that horror with which a solemn gloom is apt to fill the mind naturally raises our veneration and there is always something of an austerity and majesty. No, that's not it either. Which is the one? Do you have it there? And what that leads towards is, well, he, these kind of two demands simultaneously that they should be kind of austere. He says that they shouldn't have such gaiety of ornaments as may be proper to a luxurious palace. But at the same time, they need to use the language of architecture to inspire this sort of necessary horror and veneration. Which is a great architectural brief, isn't it? And I think he carries it off very well. It's sort of, you've got to conjure up the idea of unknowable antiquity. Yeah. Solemnity and the higher power by appealing to the idea of the primitive and original. It doesn't really matter what the primitive original does. They definitely appeal to the idea of something dredged up, regenerated from the the sort of archetypical. To talk about maybe a church that we didn't get round to visiting, the spire of St. George's Bloomsbury, one of its major component parts is this weird reworking of the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. 
And there is a real sense, I think, in the work in general, that Hawksmoor is opening up his various books of classical, antique, architectural elements and bits and bobs, and he's recombining them in really exciting and interesting ways to create a mix of effects. In that case, he's recreating the form of a Gothic spire out of a classical tomb, a Hellenistic tomb from the Near East. And I think that's another thing that creeps in is in the sort of 1690s, you get a few books turning up on the market that have the details of classical architecture of the Near East, something like uh, Dr. Maundrill's Journey from Aleppo to Jerusalem, which is released in the late 1690s, I think, which we know Hawksmoor had a copy of. These serve as reference guides that Hawksmoor is very willing to pluck quotations out of and use to recombine these quotations into buildings. This is something I'm super interested to ask a little bit about. Um, for me. I love the idea of this guy who is seems so remote from us because his architecture is so stark. I love the idea of him a kind of being a fan and like collecting stuff and mm-hmm. like looking through. There's that moment that people would have experienced in architectural design. You've got all the books out in front of you. Mm. Oh, how are we going to do this? And you just keep getting more books out, looking more stuff. And it seems very sympathetic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we talked a lot in the field recordings about these submerged references, or it's a little bit of that with a bit of this stuck through this thing. And then he's kind of taken everything down, all the detail down to kind of unify it. What do you think his attitude towards, you've read a lot more of his letters and stuff, what do you think his attitude towards collecting and thinking about these things? And like the relationship with the drawing, I think is also super important because his work is a, really feel like amazingly three-dimensionalized versions of flat things. Yes. Like yeah. there's a lot, it's very elevational, but the elevations, are, he's really breathed a fantastic life into them with all this depth and stuff, but it's still, he's got a great mastery of three dimensions, but it's very like drawing. Yeah. I mean, there's an amazing ink wash sketch and he's really keen on using ink wash to give a real sense of depth and of form in his drawings. This is something where is... you can show shadows yes, very effectively, yeah. basically, which gives you the sense of light and three-dimensional. And he, he's got a he's got a real eye for yeah, using interesting drawing techniques like that. There's an amazing sketch that he does of St. Mary's Warwick, which is a church that burns down partially in the 1690s. And we'll put that on the Instagram because it's this amazing just study in the pure abstracted form of a Gothic church reduced down to its barest sort of physical presence. And I think he's got a really interesting eye for building forms, building forms in really exciting sculptural kind of ways. It's good if you're out with graven images because it's like... It's like the massing of a Gothic church without any of the twiddles and sculptures that make them um, problematic. And I think that's what he really believes is that the Gothic forms that become the way that you build churches in the medieval period have a natural lineage from this moment of spoliated Christian architecture in the 4th century AD. And I think he really wants to, and that solves a problem for him, and and a, and a problem for church builders at the time, which is that, and Wren complains about this, congregations are very cross at the idea of losing their old beloved silhouette, the old beloved silhouette of the church spire. Yeah, and they were, they did actually, although they rebuilt most of the churches in classic form, they did rebuild a couple of them as Gothic because there was such resistance from the parish. St. Mary Aldermary particularly is a good example of that, yeah. Well, we interrupt this broadcast for a word from our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus dot com. We know that you, like us, love history in all its mysteries, secrets disclosed only to the yeah. the, the student of knowledge of true of well, true knowledge. So, what's what's a handy shortcut for the student of knowledge? If, rather than uh, I don't know, going on a grand tour to Italy or buying it's difficult. Lots that's, of, that's, that, that's a bit of a hit on the budget. Yeah, or buying lots of um, expensive manuscripts f- from various strange 
Jesuits wandering around Syria or whatever. Very much to be encouraged. In the days of the internet, these things are no longer required. We've yeah, for got, everybody. We've got The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses is an online streaming learning service. Thousands of lectures from engaging, award-winning experts. Usable, you could use it as audio or and video. Yeah, so you can do it while you work, yeah, if works. you're drawing. Often... Uh, very good illustrations, slides, visual aids. You can watch or listen anytime, anywhere. Uh, so we've been enjoying their course, Everyday Engineering, Understanding the Marvels of Daily Life. You really want to understand how things work? Yeah, how does a dam work? Yeah, how do railways work? How do power plants work? How does your, you know, how do your household appliances work? Also, I think what for me is interesting is thinking about like infrastructures and systems these sort of semi-magical things which support the whole fabric of our uh, everyday humdrum existences anyway there's a key there's a key thing you've got to know which is that you can get this all for free at least for at least for a month and the access is unlimited during that time yeah you can get it you can listen to all of the all of the lectures you might have to be listening quite a lot of lectures simultaneously (laughs) But if you can cope with us, you can cope with anything. You'll lose a lot of the benefit if you do that. Um, but if you so, if you want that offer, you need to go to our special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash buildings. What's that, Luke? That's the great courses plus. Remember the the, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash buildings. Most important to remember the buildings. Because then they'll know that it's we, us. we sent you. So at this point, let's take a minute and go to our site recording from Christchurch Spitalfields. Something I hadn't really noticed before is that the, uh, yeah, that that motif that we had on the back is actually also the form of the porch on the front. It's just been yeah. extruded into the third dimension. It's fire on the top is strange, isn't it? Because it's got this flat, even classicism, and then that's that's. I mean, it, yeah, it's some sort of early English. Yeah. Norman, something, you know, yeah. with a little run of things that feels like Ely or Saxon. So, I mean, the interior is very, has a lot of um, kind of trabiated, that is like a sort of lintel like things, doesn't it? So, across all of these columns. There's a sort of root screen by extending one of them all the way across, which feels quite daring. There's a set of four columns which run across in front of where the altar is, which have this big. Uh, like lintel across this. and then there are these the the aisles have this set of little barrel vaults but they're going perpendicular to the direction of the aisle with this very strongly expressed again lintel which feels very really um, baths like Diocletian or yes like that. absolutely and also it should be said that above the trabiated sort of pseudo rood screen that we've been talking about there sits triumphantly the lion and the unicorn the uh, scene, yeah. the, the sign of the uh, the English crown uh, yeah. um, or the British crown, oh, and yes. that's one of the things that they are really keen on stressing with these commissioners, fifty new churches, um, is the idea of marrying together church and state and yeah. sh- having prominently displayed s- symbols of state in ecclesiastical. As context. if it wasn't enough in the previous fifty, where yeah. they were already <laughs> massive. It's got a really strange kind of colonial thing, like. We're going to build these massive, white, imperious, yeah. all-around temples with yeah. in, in, in quite impoverished, in quite impoverished contexts. We're I think going, something going. interesting um, that's going on in the space now is that originally, I'm pretty sure there would have been box pews, and so all of the giant order columns which sit supporting these barrel vaults in the aisles are on these big, chunky wooden plinths, mm. and it would have been a very different sensation when there were box pews rising up to halfway up those plinths mm. and you'd had a much more sense of an aisle, yeah. a central, a central um, route to the chancel than you have now, where it's much more open and it's free, movable chairs. Often you go around the back and you think, oh, suddenly it's become like thin or fine or fruity or something. And this one it's become sort of strange. Um, It's got these, the the circular windows that we had on the sides are there, but everything's much more bunched up. And it's got a really Baroque top with those little uh, volutes, which are sort of teeny tiny and flattened down. 
Um, and the funny little triglyphs sprouting out of nowhere in particular. Yeah. Just, on the on the on the oh, top yeah, 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 just yeah. for the sheer love of it and then the central motif as we've seen before is the this palladian one of the arch between two uh rectangular windows yeah it's sort of variously called like a venetian window or a surliana yeah. depends who you're talking to um but it's quite also they... truthfully rendered to yeah. the sort of standards of what you're meant to be doing with that kind of a motif. Yeah. Ren, Ren loves it. Ren, the, Ren uses it. It is interesting. Like yeah, as you were saying, all the spacing that ha we've we've explored on the sides, it's all has all got like half as wide. It's all really, really sort of squished in. But to match, like he's he's done a quite carefully proportioned thing, and then it's got this weird flat base that comes out, and then where everywhere else. It's, sem it's semicircles. He's got these elliptical window arches. And then above them, this really strange box decoration that comes out of the, the sill of the bottom of these windows. Ooh. Rather like, you know, the boxes on the top of Limehouse, which yeah. have got this really plain, flat decoration, which is, you know, really like one line, another, you know, one line across, one line down, yeah. um, which isn't present anywhere else in the building. I think the mixing and matching of elliptical forms on the sort of ground floor mm. of this uh, is really interesting and speaks to his yeah. willingness to mix and match and play with the geometrical shapes that will best fill up the the, the blank spaces that he has available to him. Mm. He's, he's willing to stretch out and play around with... But they are ellipses. They're not yeah. like... It's quite deliberate. They're not squashed circles. Yeah. Um, they're... they're, they're like, like... So you... you they're different cuts through... The, and then there's an ellipse with a circular window beneath it. Yeah. Circular arch window yeah. beneath it. That's so, very much, yeah. That is, feels quite transgressive to me. Yeah. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's strange. It's pretty, he's ballsy, isn't he? He's ballsy all the way through. Yeah. I think you can sort of see how the various demands and the ideology move into uh, a kind of design, set of design principles, which is that they the church's sort of massiveness and solemnity and austerity is expressed in this, like it's it's massive and it's like a very simple mass, the actual body of the church. And then there's the spire, which is this semi-autonomous, enormous monument dominating the whole area. And then there is the use of the elevation for this play of different elements, which are all kind of quotations all at war with each other and all creating these effects of sort of compression and but again kind of reinforcing the massiveness and strength of the whole so the what what's often conveyed as you'll hear a bit in the site recordings are these effects of like a sort of massiveness or strength or there are very there's there are no weak elements really there and, are when, and when they do exist they seem like duff notes. Like on Alphages, bits of the tower are thin. They're completely within the normal remit of a of a church of that time. Yeah. But on against the other elements, against his thick, massive elements, they look wrong. Well, they. I think that, that yeah. There's some some of the very high up things. Again, also in St George in the East, for example, those little pepper pot. There are often things which are small, but they're kind of small and dense in their expression. They're like thick cut. Uh, sort of mm. holes into things or whatever and often a lot of his effects are created from elements which are massively magnified and expanded or that yeah and and, and probably sort of unnecessary to that like all the pepper pots and side towers and porticos don't really they are just ornaments blown up to the scale of bits of mass of the building we sort of started talking about his library and his sources it, in st mary walnoff where we visited there's, a, there's that really interesting one on the side wall where there's a direct quotation it seems from uh, borromini's architecture in rome but it's made a little bit strange because the the whole thing is a sort of isolated fragment of baroque movement which is then anchored within this enormous, completely static, massive monumental facade and then is repeated three times. But the kind of movement which it suggests can't be a part of the wider way yeah. in which mass is articulated in these churches. It's, it's an inclusion. It's like, yeah, it's another... 
Spolly has a funny way of talk, thinking about it, really, because he's taking it beyond that. It's like we're just going to include a whole idea, but as if the rest of it's been sort of faded out. We're going to take out enough... You take out so much detail that it levels things down into something else. I, I also think... I, I've been thinking a bit about this since visiting, and there is definitely a very strong feeling of the high baroque in those niches on the north wall of St. Mary of Walnuth. But also I think there is a certain allusion to the kind of Near Eastern classical architecture, architecture of the Roman Empire in modern-day Turkey and Syria going on, because you have the first site reports and sketches and things coming back from places like Baalbek, and there's quite a famous temple at Baalbek, I think, of Venus, which has that sort of concave, convex playing of a, a niche going around the exterior of a temple and so i think he's willing there to draw from a broad range of in this kind of vision we've got of him sitting with his books he's yeah. drawing from not just from contemporary baroque precedents but sort of justifying those contemporary baroque precedents by reference to the, the near eastern the near eastern antique can we talk a little bit more about his relationship to the gothic because it seems like among the ingredients so there is there's all of these classical uh, elements. There are these references to late to antiquity, to late antiquity, to early Christianity, and then there's something which he's obviously learnt from actually existing Gothic architecture, and it's all going into the same. Yeah, uh, I mean, sort of pop. like the gross shape of the buildings is a very subverted sort of Gothic, almost like or there, like the the spire. That's a gothic sort of thing to have, but he puts it at the wrong other end of the like. He's ch like with the baroque, he's changed it enough that it's not the thing anymore. It's but it's there's a lot of it in there in the proportion. And yeah, I definitely think that as we've sort of mentioned with something like Saint George in the East, there's an attempt to mimic quite specific gothic forms, and I wonder whether this is a good moment as well to jump over to briefly mentioned the work that he does that is explicitly gothic i mean he builds explicitly gothic buildings in oxford so all souls college yeah. and and he does that because there is a pre-existing gothic building and he's building an extension to it and yeah, he decides it's that it's like, going to be like with westminster or exactly and yeah. he decides it's going to be inappropriate to model the styles there and similarly he builds these two western towers of Westminster Cathedral as well and he's clearly more interested in the gothic and what the gothic might mean and taking the gothic seriously as an architectural form than many of his other contemporaries yeah. sure how do you, I mean uh, and I think actually the the gothic's very interesting I think we'll cover it at length in something else in mm. another thing um his gothic for me feels a bit different to there are things about it which are very much like him, which is that it's sort of thick and strong. And I think part of the reason that stuff is less popular is that the the kind of thick classical decoration on the front of these things is so stark and so different. Whereas, although his Gothic, I think, is quite different and similar to real Gothic, it has a fineness of decoration, which feels quite different. Like, it's more trying to fit into an idea of something. It's more trying to mm. recede into the... Like it's funny to say that like, the West, like the West End, West the Abbey is trying to recede. It's not. It's super strong. It's got some really characteristic things like him. There's loads of horizontal barring on it, yeah. which is something I really associate with Hawksmoor. It's really mm. strong, <clears throat> like making height with horizontality. That's like, does do you look taller when you wear vertical stripes or horizontal stripes? Why not um, both? <laughs> well, you kind of yeah, kind of both, but also like the the sort of taller you look is different. And he's always about this like. Really strong. Although he says in the letter about that, he says that that's also to protect the stone. He wants to drip drip details. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Mister Hawksaw. That that cathedral's not been there for very long at all. But how do you think that affects his? I'm kind of. I think for this, it'd be great to know how you feel that affects his not how the Gothic work affects his not Gothic work. I think because I think it does. I think his thinking about Gothic churches, his thinking about Gothic buildings. He scared, He looks at them as you say. He's just, he does draw this stuff. And it's something that he can go to the source for. He can't go to the source for temples in, in Turkey yeah. or, or even in France, but he can. He can go out 
out to like middle England and mm. sketch old churches and he does a bit of that because he's working on restoring them or whatever. It's, yeah. There are these literal sort of genre mashups in which stereotypically gothic elements get turned into a classical version through a kind of greater mm. or lesser degree of ingenuity, which do look quite amazing and they're quite they're these quite sort of baffling sort of forms. I think it's very exciting that you see so many different things in one object. I think that's that's not all of it. I think mm. there's something in the strength and all that sort of stuff, but it's also exciting to see, oh, it's lots of things at once and it's holding it together. I mean, I think they, you've kind of already covered this, but I think they do, in the way that they are related to the streetscapes that they exist within, they do have this feeling. There's a sketch that he does quite early on when he goes to Oxford. He does a sort of topographical sketch of the, you know, the Dreaming Spires in the 1680s. And I think he has a real clear idea of how church steeples should exist in the topographical lay of the land. And Christchurch by putting that sort of, as we discussed in the, as we discussed in the site visit, by putting that sort of Norman brooch spire sort of thing on top, it really does evoke that very visceral Gothic spire silhouette. Yeah. Which Wren, had, like Wren's churches, a really important thing about them is this. Okay, if you look at the Canaletto painting from Somerset House which you could probably put on the Instagram, you just see a city, which is this brown mass. I mean, he's made it like kind of look gorgeous, but I don't think it was that <laughs> gorgeous, really. It's like a brown mass of like brick and gunk. And above it are spires, church spires. And you see this mass of church spires. And that's what they're for. They've gone because we've got the glittering towers of commerce now. The spam can is a particularly good one, I think. No, there's like, not a lot of good ones. There was a lot of stuff that they were, it was like in the works when the financial crisis hit. And then they thought, we, we can just like increase the floor area and make it uglier because they're not getting anything through at the moment. And, yeah, uh, they're, wor they're worrying. I think that there are there are sort of general qualities of the architecture that that maybe it's good to, to define. I think, yeah, absolutely. The, he uses horizontality a lot. And I think that that's also part of the way in which he uses, in which he kind of conveys like weight and compression as these sort of yeah. primary kind of expressions of, of the relationship between elements. I mean, I think we should talk a little bit. So when we were doing this, we were going to go to a few more of the churches, but we... Um, well, our, all, our, all of the rest of them. Our courage failed a bit because we were so wet. So there are a couple that we didn't visit together, but which we've been to separately before. So is it worth saying something about St. George's Bloomsbury? It's just by um, the British Museum. British Museum yeah. And it's got a big sort of traditional portico doesn't it which none of the other all the others the the portico so it, this form is is quite sublimated or it's been you, quite transformed at the street level what you see when you're up close to it is a huge portico yeah huge like um, classic classic kind of big, temple heavy, temple, yeah, front. temple front yeah um and that's that that's clearly something that he's been wanting to do for a while we've got sketches of him plonking proper classical porticos on the front of things from quite early the, on. Uh, the, the next nearest one is like Alfage, which yeah. has this thing that's trying to... Uh, I really want to be a classical portico, but yeah. it isn't. Mm. <laughs> like, um, but I, the, the, the classical portico at Bloomsbury is also serving quite a practical purpose, which is that he has this really difficult site that is very long and thin north to south, and he needs to turn it into a church that is orientated east to west with the long access the long axis going from the east from the west to the east that's a kind of unbreakable liturgical rule exactly at this point. yeah exactly you've got, you've got i think you've got about 15 degrees of play or maybe 20 at most you can't go out of that and so this big chunky portico is a part of solving some of that problem of this long thin site that's running in the wrong direction because it takes up the big southern third of the site pretty much it's also because yeah, he just loves doing it though, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's also there's a lot of that feels like a bit of an excuse too yeah, yeah. It's well into it. it the the impression is quite different from the others because it's so this and walnut are both yeah. very hemmed in um and this one the big this big very impressive tower you actually only really see 
from quite close in. You sort of see it down an alley between it and the uh, adjacent building. It would originally have been a bit more visible because the buildings around it have got bigger in the yeah. in the succeeding well, years. In- Famously, it appears in the background of Hogarth's etching Gin Lane. Where you can yes. see it uh, there's a woman dropping her baby down some stairs and it's there yeah. in the background yeah because this is <laughs> this is bloomsbury prior to and sort of seven dials prior to the georgian square expansion that's going to happen yeah. in the mid 18th century or, or late second half of the 18th century this is a quite a quite a down at heel part of london at the- or a funny mixture yeah, like yeah. the funny mixture of like but it wasn't. It was like a commercial area where stuff was going on. It wasn't rich. Yeah. It was, but it was a businessy sort of area. But the th- the thing that appears most clearly in the background of that Hogarth is the spire, which we've sort of already made mention of. But is one of the wildly, most wildly inventive things that Hawksmoor designs, topped with a massive lion, massive unicorn, the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, topped with George the yeah. First standing atop a Roman altar. Yes. So and that that's because so this is a political symbol this one isn't it? Because the unicorn is kind of prostrate towards the bottom of the uh so the um the fighting line and unicorn symbolizes the end of the first Jacobite uprising in 1715. That's what's going on there. I think in 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 the Hogarth the you've got so you've got Gin Lane and you've got this tottering ludicrous over inventive spire with George tottering on top of it hogarth hogarth is attacking the wasted money of of the excessive um the excessive expenditure on these churches and it's worth maybe saying that in that hogarth the st george's bloomsbury against the gin soaked seven dials is contrasted with another print called beer street where st martin in the fields is yes. contrasted with a the, good but less good church. Yes, <laughs> um, but a much more influential church in terms of the number of copycats it spawned. Yeah, so I mean, maybe that is a good moment actually to talk a little bit about the about why that might be, and what it is that St. so so. Uh, ostensibly they're both churches of the same generation they're both built more or less at exactly the same time by architects who had both been employed though not necessarily completely at the same time by the same commission but the wind is kind of changing and at the moment that all of these Hawksmoor churches are being finished off there is a big move in architectural culture in England away from what his architecture represents and basically it's going to go massively out of fashion so what is it that people we could start by talking about what's different about st martin martin in the fields from the other from the hawksmoor Mm. churches it like them is big white stone pretty massive classical it's got a spire although the spire the first thing that's different is that the spire is on top and it's set back a little bit from the portico so it's sitting directly on top of the entrance but unlike Christchurch it's not kind of sitting on top of the entrance portico the portico and actually the mass of the church in general is expressed quite a lot like it looks kind of like the Maison Carré or something it Mm -hmm. looks like a classic Roman temple form and quite proper it's there's a real sense of propriety about the way in which it uses the classical language, which is completely different from this uh, freewheeling, yeah, inventive, fancy is a word that yeah. Hawksmoor uses quite often in his letters. This idea of good fancy or or or, or that that fancy that the powers of the imagination can be brought in to do something new and interesting and inventive. Yeah, and so in when Hawksmoor's use of the classical vocabulary, things get massively bigger and smaller than they should be. They kind of go to war against each other, like elements which gesture towards the Gothic or towards different sort of bits of the classical canon are all like juxtaposed yeah. and mashed and overlaid and things. And, and there's, there's very also, little of that in, in the Gibbs church. Yeah, Hawksmoor's buildings are full of inner stresses and contradictions and great forces that are pushing against each other. And that's just being pushed out. It's yeah. all about even 
care. Like good taste. Yes, it's pro- It's proper. It's good very taste. propriety. And and so the spire of St Martin's in the Fields, in some way, doesn't really threaten the. Yeah, that, and it is that, quite a strange sort of spire with these circular cutouts going up it, but yeah. not not Hawksmoor level strange. There's an attempt to sort of defend Gibbs slightly. There's an attempt... It's, good. it's a good it's, building. It's a good building. And he he does attempt to... Luke's not so sure. <laughs> well, it's probably the best building on Trafalgar Square. Quite like the lions. Yeah. <laughs> there is an interesting moment where the sort of the weight of the spire is accommodated for in the size elevation where you have a doubling up, a, a sort of recess with columns and a sort of doubling up of the rhythm of the pilasters to accommodate the strength but it's a much less muscular and form shaping move than the kind of moves that Hawksmoor would make with a There's nothing problem. that's going to find the horses there. What you're getting there I mean is basically the the generation of 1680 was this this the weak ascendancy and the in the 1720s there the kind of for the succeeding generation, their sons and nephews and all that, are the pendulum is swinging back again, and they now are are kind of taking over again. I think that the thing is that Wren has absolutely dominated the architectural scene for a long time, but by the 1710s, Wren is in his 70s and he dies in in 1723. Hawksmoor has come of age, and 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 come to his the height of his success, broadly under Wren's supervision. And then, and he's broken out on his own, but he's still very much associated with Wren. And you have a generation who are broadly opposed to Wren and Hawksmoor's style of building. And I'm not saying that Wren and Hawksmoor build in the same way, but I'm saying that certainly in terms of the social circles of architecture, they're associated with one another and you have this generation of people that come up around particularly Richard Boyle who's Lord Burlington in the late 1710s and 1720s people like Colin Campbell who publishes a book called Vitruvius Britannicus people like uh, Roger Morris there's the and people these are like, the people who build all the big houses yeah exactly like big, big wig country wig houses country houses exactly yeah. exactly and People talk about them as Palladians mm. because they've been on the tour and they kind of regard the proper interpretation as Palladios, Andrea Palladios kind of interpretation of, of classical form. And they also want to dethrone Wren as the sort of preeminent English architect in favour of Inigo Jones. Exactly. Yeah. So the Vitruvius Britannicus that is referred to in the title of Colin Campbell's book is referring to Inigo Jones. All of these architects we're talking about, every single one of them of every generation is in the shadow of Palladio. Hawksmoor is super influenced by Palladio. Wren is super influenced by... Inigo Jones is almost a Palladio-like cover act, although he can't quite mm. do it. He's pretty good, but it, it seems like everyone's arguing over. No, I'm the real Palladio. <laughs> yeah, like follower. But the the Palladians have, yeah, they got a much more strict interpretation, or they want to they want to have a lot more rules. You can't go around suddenly making things bigger and smaller. You have got to stick to the these sort of the proper combination of the elements. We can't just have these kind of abstract boxes and then stick whatever seems to fit on the outside. Okay. We've got to have a very clear hierarchy of, you know... No dabbling with the canon. And and so there's a power play that's made in, the, in about 1716, 1717, I think, where one of the people who wants to be in this circle of Palladians, a man called William Benson, gets himself made the chief surveyor of the king's works and... One of the things that he does with that is he goes to the House of Lords and says, oh, no, this is all imminently going to fall down. I'm going to need you all to leave and me to get to build a massive Palladian replacement for it. And then Gibbs and Hawksmoor come and survey the House of Lords and say, "Mm, I don't think this is falling down, actually. And uh, then Benson is shipped out in shame 
And so there are these kinds of power plays going on. Who's going to be the next big hitter? And what are the big defining projects of the next generation going to be? I mean, and actually the sort of statement buildings of the Palladians are also being built at the same time as these churches. So Chiswick House, which Burlington builds for himself, it's going up in the late 1720s, I think. Yeah. And then Burlington House as well, which is Burlington's city, yeah. you know, enormous townhouse. I might go to an interesting critical moment in terms of the changing reception of Hawksmoor's churches. Who are his supporters? Like, we've heard, we haven't actually said anything about how they were received when they were going up, rather than the people who were against them. Is that, do, we have, do we know? Because I know nothing about that at all. The Tories who are building the churches and who are in charge of the commission are happy because they spent yeah. a lot. These were these churches were very expensive. But I, I think because of that expense, something an idea that comes in very early is the idea that they are excessive, that they are sort of reflective of a lack of restraint in the public purse. I think that's a narrative that sets in very early on. Yeah, Tories are meant to be like high spenders and uh, Whigs are meant to be low taxes. Um, And so that's something that's picked up by this man, James Rafe, who writes a book in 1734 called, uh, titled A Critical Review of the Public Buildings and Ornaments in and About London and Westminster. And Rafe is American born. He's friends with Benjamin Franklin. He's working in this emergent Grub Street newspaper industry, writing cultural reviews and things. The London press was actually on a street called Grub Street, mm. which and is underneath <coughs> the Barbican mostly now. Mm. It's yeah. one of the ones that got demolished for that. Anyway. And he's really desperate to get in with Burlington Circle. And so he dedicates this book, this first print of this book, he dedicates it to Burlington. And in that, he says... At a time, my lord, when so much money is lavished in building, and too often with so little pretense to beauty or magnificence, it could be unreasonable to publish some hints on a subject so frequently employed and so seldom understood. So he's playing up there to this idea we've been talking about, about aristocratic taste, and he's very deferential to Burlington's expertise in this area. And then he turns his critical eye and this, this conception of Palladian taste on Hawksmoor's work, and Hawksmoor is found wanting. He says, of Hawksmoor's churches, there are not five placed to advantage, and scarce so many which are built in taste or deserve half the money which they have cost, a circumstance which must reflect on the judgments of those who chose the plans as well as the genius of the architects themselves. They are mere gothic heaps gothic, but with an I-Q-U-E on the end, heaps of stone without form or order and meet with contempt from the best and worst tastes alike. The last, especially Christchurch, Spitalfields, deserves the severest condemnation in that it is built at a monstrous expense and yet is, beyond question, one of the most absurd piles in Europe. (laughs) I'm not sure history has been very kind to that judgment. I think that... In the choice to to call them out as gothic, and to, and he's playing into a gothic just basically just means bad taste. <laughs> it does basically mean bad taste, but it's more specific than that as well because Colin Campbell in Vitruvius Britannicus says that Wren, you know, English Baroque Wren Hawksmoor type stuff, and and French Baroque stuff as well. At its worst, it verges on the gothic, and so the idea that the Baroque can tumble accidentally. Or, or, or whatever it is that Hawksmoor's doing that's inventive can tumble accidentally into the Gothic, which is by its very definition barbarous and uncouth. Yeah. And by that, does he mean the like accretion of things that you get in Gothic? Does he mean Gothic massing? Yeah. Does he mean Gothic complication? I think he means the accretion of things and he means the willingness to break outside of the narrow book bound classical precedence exactly these guys are such jerks by the way i really they really get my goat this brigade was going for like 250 years and you read them they're always absolute jerks yeah 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 it's a bad business um yeah um and there's a great moment in the letters to the dean that i remarked on earlier i realized there's a a few quotes here but where hawksmore hits back at rafe and hawksmore says i wish i had 
the honour to know whether they are gentlemen, connoisseurs, critics or workmen advanced to the degree of architects. Be that as it will, I dare pronounce they are not enough skilled in masonry in the styles of building if they will object that the new works and repairs are not comfortable and pursuant. And so at Rafe specifically, he says, It appears to me that they do not rightly understand the word Gothic, but made use of it as Mr. Rafe the critic did who mistaking the whole history of building and also all or most of the terms of the art among the rest he makes use of the word gothic to signify everything that displeases him that's definitely going on there's obviously in case you have got this a massive class thing going on here where hawksmore is someone who's come up from basically obscurity and these guys are all people who are in aristocratic circles and want aristocratic advancement yeah like they may not be super rich people themselves but they're trying to wheedle their way up yeah through the courts yeah i mean and hawksmore never really because as an architect he also sort of had to run the jobs he had to procure the materials he had to make sure that the whole kind of procurement supply chain was running effectively and that people weren't using the wrong stuff or skimping on things or doing things wrong some of his letters say that you are noting things these kind of classic snagging things like they seem to have plastered that passage which was actually meant to be ashler stone or whatever and you know yeah yeah <laughs> done it too quickly and it's all falling off the wall yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. um and he was doing this for other he was doing this for he was doing that not only for his own buildings but for a number of buildings designed by aristocratic fops some of whom are pretty good architects but uh definitely not quite so um, yeah i mean he, he had his he has his big aristocratic ally sir john yeah vanbra van dashing who was very you know, he's very right yeah playwright spy war, <laughs> yeah warrior <laughs> held overseas yeah yeah who, fancy hairdo i think we'll get into who, who's he's kind of a fun he's kind of a fun character and also i think a, a sort of decent architecture in his in his yeah. own right but who was definitely backing hawksmore's interpretation of and the two i think would have been a little bit in cahoots with sort of coming up with the approach that they wanted to take to various various things yeah this so, one Walnuts. St. Mary it has, Walnuts. It has an amazing stripy base, which is so strong and so strange. Yeah. It's really whack. I loved going past this all the way through. And yeah. then and then the front's also really blind. And and the, there's this sort of vent thing in the middle with in the bell tower and everything is really the aspect ratios are so stretch. Yeah. Yeah. To maybe give a little bit more flesh on the stripy bones, this sort of main body of the church is echoed on the facade with this really strange channeled rustication that does just express itself as stripes with two giant order Tuscan columns on either side of the, the yeah. central facade. But they're completely but the, then, um, without, they, they go straight up, they're, they're, yeah, um, they yeah. don't have any um, bend to them. And then these, this extraordinary channeling which expresses this stripy facade yeah. bends downwards very yeah. suddenly at very sharp it's angles it's kind of drawn it's drawn in there's there's this like big uh kind of rectangular face which is which becomes these columns at either side and then you've got an arched opening below and a like half circle lunette above and both of them produce these radial lines which go out and interfere with and become the lines of the rustication it's it's so strong it's so tough it's very very it, like the effect is funny because so yeah kind of going up you go into what feels like it's going to become a spire or whatever, but it just stops and it becomes these two little boxes on top with arches. Uh, there's a story which is almost completely blank, which has a whole series of Corinthian columns going all around it and then one opening for the bells. And then there's a completely, there's some like a podium level, but which is, well, I mean, it reads as a podium for the level above, but it's actually sitting on top of the building. It's been plopped on top and it's got these three little square windows which are punching through which look like, well, I mean, they look like the windows of a basement, don't they? They don't look like the windows of an attic. And I think it's an interesting choice as well in the cornice it's that stands above the main stripy facade, as you will. Yeah. Um, there is these really heavily and emphatically emphasized sort of console brackets that support the cornice. Yeah. And, 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 and yeah. really just punch out that, that, mid, that mid-rise level through the whole facade. Yeah. Let's go closer. So this one is, um, there, there was an instruction that all of these churches had to be insular, that they all had to be uh, detached from their surroundings for reasons of kind of grandeur and effect. But this one is much 
partly because the subsequent development around it has got so enormous during the 19th century, yeah, that, that effect is much diminished. Really We're in the middle of the medieval city and it's super dense, super commercial land. So they didn't, it wasn't really possible. It's worth saying that um, this is the only one of the Hawksmoor churches which is inside the old city of London, you know, adjacent to all of the Wren post-fire churches. All of the others are sort of out in su emerging suburbs and things, whereas this is right in the thick of things. So we're looking at the north wall and there are these three kind of alcoves on the side. And they, the thing which first grabs my attention is that you've got this thing which looks like it's been cribbed from the Italian Baroque of the previous century, where it's got a, like a sort of entablature thing on top of these two columns, but which is bending inwards to create a semicircle. And the whole of the architecture of it is sort of being stretched and bent to create kind of distorting perspective as well. Yeah, there are sets of or pairs of ionic columns standing underneath architraves that have been bent, moulded inwards to match the niche and you get these very sharp corner points which as you sort of said they're very Borromini-esque I would say yeah. uh, is what they're most reminiscent of and they give a real sense and, and, and equally the plinths on which those columns mm. stand turn outwards mm. and offer these very pointed corners which again give the, gives the facade a real sense of depth. Yeah, um, it's, it's strange it, that how the three of them are sort of sat on the facade, but they're also very restrained within the little the little part of the facade that they're on. So if you continue down below each one of them, you've then got this extremely abstractly expressed, like heavy, again, the heavy keystone motif, but very, very stripped back. It's very planar, very graphic. Again, it looks a little bit deco it, and it's totally like orthogonal in a way. All of that perspectival distortion only exists within the magic window of the, the quotation that's above it. It doesn't, you know, in the Italian Baroque, these sorts of effects infect everything and they become the whole facade and everything is going all over the place. But here, it's this one little quotation which he's taken and it's situated, pop, 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 been photocopied three times across the facade, but it doesn't affect the incredible like solidity and squareness of the overall form. And you can see he could have chosen to continue that rustication from the facade around this wall. Yeah. But he's very deliberately, as you said, chosen to sort of coin, put coins on the niches and then to leave these spaces of blank ashlar, which yeah. actually make the individual niches much more effective and much more evocative yeah. of the day. He's playing with a notion of there's a form and things sort of emerging and submerging within it. So. Yeah. We've always got rectangular recesses with things inside them and stuff coming out. But the mass, the sort of levels of massing remain constant. So there's the size of the building, then there's the level of the, the gross moves, the towers and the things jutting in and out, and then the level of decoration from that. And you have a much, a much greater harmonization. Because the, the decoration is so strong, so deeply cut, and because in a way some of the secondary moves are so small, there's a much greater harmony between them, but you always get a sense of things coming in and going out. There's also this was got, you can see the facade is not designed to be looked at just from such a close angle because there's a really fancy balustrade with the funny decorative um, volutes and stuff on the sides. Uh, which you kind of can't see. <laughs> no. Yeah, you get. I think that's definitely something that perhaps has come through more than once. Is this sense that of the like the masonry is a sort of blank sheet of paper that there is a neutral ground which is the the kind of unfigured ashlar masonry and that a big part of what's going on in the design of these facades is the arranging of Forms yeah that yeah come out but also drive in yeah drive inside and, and express a depth there's a real feeling of depth and solidity in this yeah. wall but the 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 paper like the sheet of paper never disappears it, you yeah. always see the edges it's, of it i would i would emphasize it's three dimensions because it yeah. it doesn't just work on I know this is we're talking about facades and they mm. are facades but they're always forms and it is always like that corner in um, Brunelleschi it's always things it's always quite defined solid shapes coming mm. in and out mm. and the fact that they're so deep and they're so hard cut really yeah but at the same time it's boxiness is important like it's yeah. the sort of it's abstractness sure. is something which is uh, is kind of innate should we have a look inside? Yeah, 
So it's important that this one is very different from the other ones we've seen, which are more or less kind of more or less a model, isn't there, for these East End churches, that they're a basilica form, they're big, they're long. They're longitudinal, yeah, fundamentally. Yeah. Um, this feels much more centrally planned or centrally focused, certainly. Yeah. It's fitted around this cube. Yeah. And we have a, a sort of a lantern with yeah. four enormous lunette windows bringing from a sort of clear story, yeah. bringing light in. And those, those lunettes are supported by 12 enormous Corinthian giant order columns which yeah. sit within and really dominate the mm -hmm. centre of the interior. So in, in a rather submerged form, it's, it is kind of Greek cross church, isn't it? It's, he's slightly pretending that that's not what's going on, but you can see that that's... With weird manoeuvres, the pulpit is, is very strange because there's a sort of crypto chapel, crypt, I mean, crypto choir, crypto body. Yeah. There are these three very subtle steps leading up yeah. to the altar. Are those, the are they... so, the, so, so this is the interesting thing where... The Victorians really had a go with this one. Um, William Butterfield is the architect who also built All Saints, Margaret Street, who renovates the interior of this. And originally, the altar would have been at ground level, at the same level of the rest of the church. And this also would have been box pews, same as we've mentioned at Christchurch. But 19th century Tractarianism demanded that the altar be raised up. And so if you see the sort of Reredos, which is original Hawksmoor, mm. It sits much more uncomfortably within the niche oh. than it would originally have because the Victorians have raised it up about three foot. So that's this this big screen behind the altar with these the, the, these kind of spiraling column, the kind of corkscrew Solum, columns. Solemn sodic candy cone. Yeah, it, the effect is accentuated because the arch is like an elliptical arch; it's very flat, so there's not a lot of space to push up into. But you can see that those. They shut this dodgy choir in as well. Yeah, they shoved the dodgy choir in, and the other main thing that they did is they ripped out the galleries. So there would have originally been galleries. We have the facings of the galleries left, pinned up against the wall in a very odd sort of decision. But originally they would have been right up against these giant order columns, and all the way around, we would have had gallery space which again I think would make it less greek cross i think you would have made it less greek cross, i think yeah. part of this this thing of it being centrally planned is a bit just forced by sight and actually i think he's yeah. doing a lot of tricks to make it less like that but the pulpit was that there so i think the pulpit was originally there sure, where yeah. that sort of funny choir has been forced so that's yeah, yeah, on the altar that. side i mean they put it in a completely stupid place yeah. well that's the victorians for you <laughs> I, I do find the, the decision to retain the facade of the gallery a very interesting one on Butterfield's part. It's a real guilt complex, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, and it, yeah, it's a real guilt complex about his relationship to Hawksmoor, but then it's also a very strange sort of remembrance of that Victorian decision to get rid of spaces that allow mm. the congregation to sit above the altar. Mm. It's sort of saying, no, no, no you will sit below, we will raise the altar up and you will sit below uh, and also strip out all the box pews so you will face towards the altar. I think what strikes me looking at the interiors of these is how much, like the pains that they go to to create a sense of like trabiated form, so post and lintel form on the inside, mm -hmm. which is funny because that's not really how the structure of any of them work. Traditionally in churches, things either work with vaulting, with arches, or they work with like these pitched roofs, which are made from timber. Um, but the way in which they're expressed, they're expressed as if they were these Greek temples with these stone lintels going between columns. And it's, it's kind of funny that, that this is what he wants to keep bringing it back to. It's it really strong. I mean, I, I don't mean, oh, that, that's so strong. I mean, it's, it's a form which it goes with his kind of cut stone. It's so, it's crisp and heavy and powerful and it denotes strength. Rather like, you remember when we were talking about Michelangelo, mm. we were talking about the, they're not called the conservators, or whatever that council of judges is mm. called, in there that he's, he's working on the strength of this horizontal line mm. and bringing that out by all sorts of trickery to make it look as if the stone is what's holding everything up. At the same time, I think it's a little bit, 
there is something uncomfortable about it that you often come through lots of arched openings. You know, you, you'd come through these contradictory, you know, the door which, which you come through will be an arch. Of, sometimes there'll be like a dome above the, the space under the tower. You'll come through another arch. And then you come into this room where suddenly everything is reserved for this like trabeated form which is, hasn't been expressed anywhere on the outside and it is a bit of a it's a bit of a contradiction cornice is cut so yeah in the, this, you know oh yeah no it's all it's fake it's fake as well but it's it, it, it gives it a real it's showing off its fake yeah. it's, it's but it's it, it it's that vertical bounding yeah, i wonder i think that there's also a thing where often they have these flat ceilings on the inside so that whereas the buildings on the outside often have a real sense of vertical lift and of moving upwards, and the corners are accentuated by these these like little objects which will be placed there to disrupt the corners and to create this kind of irregular upthrusting inside you're always being borne down on by this single uniform plane which will have some kind of bit of nice plaster work or something on it but it's yeah i i've always I, I've always found the interiors a little bit contradictory. With Hawksmoor. I like them more this time. Yeah. Like, I, I kind of agree with you. You think of this weight of cut stone, you know, the outside, and the, the big shapes go away on the interior. Yeah. The outside, it's these blocky, you know, rectilinear right angles cut in, pushed out, very big, very thick, heavy. Inside, it's light plaster decoration, mm. you know, twiddles, yeah. egg and dart molding. Um, acanthus leaves, white and gilding. Yeah. But actually, uh, before I thought, oh, this is just a period, right? That's what they wanted. They wanted, you know, wooden pews at the bottom and then a sort of layer of white going to heaven. But I think there is something. I think this, like, strange, you feel like you're going into something more civilized on the outside. The outside is really mm. tough. It's holding off the city. It's yeah. impressive and imperious. It's kind of castle-like. Mm. You can see this idea of, you know, the state's going to put these things in to, to cure mm. out all those savages having fun in, mm. out, in, yeah. out in the yeah. suburbs. Yeah. And the inside is, is for the elect. Yes. Yes. But I think yes. it kind of holds you in the, in the, you know, the outside of the oyster is hard and rough and the inside is shiny and pearly. Mm. And well, we should say one that. thing, which is that the churches have been very very resilient in spite of never really having a kind of golden age of being lauded. Uh, mm. And uh, they've um, almost all of them have been either gutted, unsympathetically refurbished or burnt down or bombed at Often some point. Often multiple of those or, things. Yeah, yeah. Only one Often of, gutted and then bombed and burnt down. So yeah. only one has been um, utterly destroyed. So there were two final ones which were built with John James for which Hawksmoor is thought to have designed the spires but not the church. So there's St Luke's uh, Old Street, which I think was burnt out in the war and is now a classical music venue. Um, and St John Horsley Down, which was to the south of Tower Bridge, and which was demolished finally in the 1970s. Classy move there. Yeah. And they both have these quite amazing towers, which are like obelisks, aren't they? So, I mean, St. Luke's is a big a big obelisk, and yeah, St. John like, Horsley Down was like a, some like kind a of... fluted sort of square, slightly tapered, really big fluted square column. The other one is even stranger. It's like this really thin ionic column yeah it basically. looks like um it looks like one of the columns from a roman wall painting yeah these kind of impossible yeah, like third, columns like that you get period wall painting yeah really quite strange yeah not neither of those are his best ones the luke's tower is pretty cool as a tower though it really yeah does the business and then I, then I wanted to say a word about the other, a couple of the other churches from the programme. So the, the John James Church, St. George, Hanover Square, it's the one of the only ones which isn't properly isolated from surrounding buildings. I don't quite know why that is, but it's kind of built up. It's got a sort of Roman style portico, but it means that it has this rather nice a um, aspect where you approach it and you come across it by accident in these slightly winding streets just to the west of Regent Street, which gives it this feeling a little bit like something you might encounter in an Italian city or something like that, you know, an actually Roman church. And then Thomas Archer's St. John Smith Square 
which is quite a cool mm. building. Uh, it has these four big, these like four towers at the corners. The, the, the probably apocryphal story about that is that when Queen Anne was asking about the design, what the design was going to be, uh, Archer supposedly flipped over a footstool yes. and said it's basically going to look like that because you're going to have four pokey bits up in each of the corners. <laughs> oh, yeah, who knows? But it, it's, Has it's, anyone seen the favourite recently? Yeah. Well, uh... <laughs> uh, but it's quite, it's very impressive. And because it's in the middle of a square, which is a setting unlike any of the others, it's got this very, and it's sort of raised up on a big podium. Uh, it's got this pretty kind of strong, impressive structure. Again, that one also bombed. Also now a venue for classical music sort of seems the direction they're going in. Well, they're, they're big old things. Like six grannies at the front look a bit silly in them. There are some churches with big congregations, but unless it's been taken over by like hardcore evangelicals, most of the Anglican churches are basically empty. So We've talked a lot about the ways in which he's trying to dig out precedents, but I would say history's judgment on these buildings is that they are starkly original. And I don't believe architects who say they're not trying to push push on the discipline and mm. like you you tend to hide behind the idea of I'm just being appropriate. He was clearly being radical. Yeah. How got any thoughts about how he was, what he thought he was doing? Did he think he was for himself? I mean, I know the, there's a problem that letters are written to clients, right? A lot of them, but yeah. I mean, I think just on on letters being written for clients and again i i do have the sense that he's quite canny at telling clients what they want to hear the quotation that we had at the beginning where he's completely laying into everything that's being built in london and that the opportunity to replan london has completely failed that comes in the context of him trying to convince oxford to let him replan oxford in a pretty serious way so i think he is very good in these letters at telling clients what he wants to do got to be there's two key skills for um architects you've got to be able to draw and you've got to be able to like sort out people yeah <laughs> appease. otherwise there's no buildings and he also clearly has quite a close relationship with the people that he's working on site with as well out of these letters um particularly um i think we'll talk about this in the future i suspect but blenheim he has these dozens of letters backwards and forwards with Harry Joins, who's the head of the sort of clerk of works there, and they are quite fatherly and loving at various moments. He seems to have been a nice guy. Yeah. yeah. Also, I think he felt so put upon by these aristocratic bastards <laughs> um, <laughs> that, like, he was extremely sympathetic with anyone else who was having to deal with them. So, one thing I was talking to one of my tutors about this, and one point that they made which is sort of less favourable to him, is basically it's all of the inventive stuff is a result of him not going to see anything. All of the inventive stuff... I don't think that's true. No, I don't think that's that's true either. There clearly is something exciting going on in the project here. I think it does come back to this idea of a Christian architecture that draws on classical precedent but that does something new and something fitting for christianity i do think that's that that is something that he is genuinely he might have just gone to like ro- like <clears throat> he might have just gone and seen michelangelo and gone oh you can do whatever you want mm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. people people do that as well yeah yeah there is something which to me i th- i think yeah i wouldn't go that far i think that there's something about it which does seem to come out of this exercise in quotation that they Mm. are these super static masses. The elements can't break out of the essentially sort of abstract massing of the building. I mean, they do a little bit. They kind of pop out of the top of the roof and the the tower becomes has its own sort of centre of gravity and axiality. But I think that the effects that are procured are so strong. It's not an accident that the buildings are as powerful as they are. I think if... There is a working within limitations that's going on. It's also like a hugely productive one. That's sort of innate to the design process as well, isn't it? That you have to set yourself a set of rules that you abide by and the pushing against that resistance is what the what the productive uh, kind of energy is. It's a much more open 
sort of set of constraints than the ones that the Palladians are then going to come up with are, which are like basically. It's not a good. It's not a good move for an architectural or art movement to say someone else in the past has done it well, so we should create a list of rules by which you can attempt to imitate them. Mm. That's always a bad idea unless you're prepared to then completely transgress them or completely ignore them. I was just I was just thinking about it because so the Pantheon, the Church of Saint Genevieve in um, Paris by uh, Soufflo, it's late, like significantly later, but it's also a building which has an interesting way of kind of reconsidering the relationship between the Gothic and the classical. Like that, it's a building which also tries to think what could a classical building do with some of the ideas from the Gothic, and it, yeah. you know, and it's much more overtly not Palladian. Yeah. It's this is Greek like Greek revival. I mean not not the Greek revival, but like yeah, Greek yeah. Greeky. Yeah. I know this is a cop out, but I think part of the reason that he has come so fully back into the canon and become, you know, one of the most important English architects of this, you know, of 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 the sort of stretch, now, the the most I'd say yeah. in terms of critical opinion, like yeah. he's the best regarded English 18th and, century. Author. And you know, he gets gestured out in Biennale shows and all of this kind of stuff. I think a lot of that is because we have unanswered questions still, and that we could go on talking for hours about what we think he's trying to do because they are such wildly inventive and exciting masses and forms and mysterious as well. and yeah mysterious so i know that's a cop-out answer but i think the mystery is part of it i think that he does something like people through history kind of rediscover and reclaim him and some of the more, more recent was like postmodern historicists like venturi and others but i think that there's something which he does which sort of lifts him above just doing quotation and i think that that is the kind of compositional thing which he does on the on the facades that between the different elements there's this this relationship which is sort of charged by this sense of mass and heaviness and it's sort of a weird incredibly static dynamism everything is very still it's not moving but it's full of like potential energy you know it's like a spring or something yeah it's like it's like ruskin's rocks right he looks at the rock and he just sees power in it Hmm. a mountain crushing this thing down the you know distorted it's like that it's that power you know i thought that the person who he's put in with is so naturally i think in terms of english architects and they're really different and similar like obviously so is the opposite of austere most of the time Hmm. Uh, and Hawksmoor is, but they're both prepared to dabble with the canton. They're both prepared to, to not regard it as a set of rules, but like history is something you can use as a tool. And also because he's not trying to recreate something that any that anyone knows kind of exists. And so has got a bit of that too. I mean, what does an ancient Roman massive office complex look like? Yeah, it's difficult. Doesn't, it's difficult to know. <laughs> you know, what does... Yeah, you know, rather like the Victorians later, what what is an appropriate <laughs> medieval shopping centre, shopping yeah. mall look like? Make it yourself, don't you? What does a what does a government ministry built in the thirteenth century look like? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, what is a good Gothic cinema? Well, I hope you've enjoyed it and yeah, look them up. We'll put some pictures of them up, but Yeah, we'll put some pictures up. They're some of my really favourite buildings in London. Yeah, I think that the the great buildings tend to be things tend to be an end, don't they? Yeah, or a high to, point. Yeah. He's also an outlier. I mean, the English may... I know we have a reputation as occasionally for eccentric, but we're generally conservative. Mm. Like, his, in, with, in architecture, yeah. it's generally pretty conservative in England. There's not a lot of wild, cool stuff in London. <laughs> There's occasional bursts of stuff, but it's not the rule. When it does happen, it's usually facilitated by political movements with weird and very niche bees in their bonnet and problems they're going to solve um yeah well we've certainly recorded i think we've recorded enough material so oh uh that's good <laughs> we don't need to worry about that then yeah but yeah i hope you enjoyed it remember that you can find that all those images and things will be on our various social medias at about underscore buildings um, there's hours and hours of extra content on patreon if you're interested in subscribing yeah some of it's good yeah <laughs> we'll be delving we'll be exploring spooky occult hawks more 
the secret hermetic meanings of all of his different yeah. pyramids and obelisks and so on in the in the bonus, which will be good. It's only three dollars American per month. Also, thank you very much for people who reviewed. That helps us. Yeah, and it's also very nice for our egos. Yeah, and thank you, Matt. Yeah, You're thank welcome. You, Matt. You're welcome. Good uh, luck with this one. Cut out all the bits where I say anything wrong. <laughs> the prerogative of the editor is uh, to make them sound, make them sound, <laughs> yes. themselves sound good. But hopefully us too. So, with that, goodbye. 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 goodbye.